before I ask NJN's Elizabeth Christofferson to introduce Lillian Rodriguez Lopez, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our sponsors for supporting tonight's female entrepreneur lecture. Now, let me turn it off to uh, turn it over to Elizabeth, who is one of the state's uh, best entrepreneurs in her own right, the best social entrepreneurs because she runs a nonprofit. Elizabeth, it's all yours. Thanks, Jim. It's really great to be here again. You know, when you heard Dean Moore welcome all of you, and by the way, it was great to hear him welcome you because it's uh, tonight. Uh, you said, Dean Moore, not only what a beautiful place this is to really celebrate the great ideas, the winners, those of you who have participated, but you also noted that you were taking some direction from Jim Brood. I too take a little direction from Jim because when he calls, I know that this is going to be a really tremendous night, that we're going to get to meet some of our, uh, some great leaders uh, in the future, really, who are going to be our business leaders, our civic leaders, and people who really are going to matter and hopefully will not only be uh, connecting to that great mentoring idea and the opportunity to partner with FDU. And it's one of the reasons I'm so pleased on behalf of New Jersey Network, New Jersey's public television station, to be here tonight to have the honor to introduce our keynote speaker is because of the great energy, the great spirit, the great opportunity to connect tonight uh, with people who have ideas who are going to make a difference. So I thank you, uh, Dean and Jim, for that uh, opportunity. Well, tonight uh, we have a very, very special speaker uh, for the 2008 Female Entrepreneurial Lecture. And the thread that weaves through Lillian's extraordinary accomplishments is her deep commitment to public service. I'd also say it's her deep spirit and conviction. I'm sure she's going to tell you a few stories that go far beyond what her biographical information in your program and the things that I'm going to tell you, because already in the few moments when we were talking tonight, she was talking about uh, some of the ways that she stepped outside of maybe what was expected of her and with uh, courage and conviction about the things that mattered. But she began her journey as a student in the Bronx public school system. She then attended Fordham University, where she received her BA in communications and later completed the National Hispanic Leadership Institute Executive Program at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. She serves as the president of the Hispanic Federation, which is a nonprofit membership organization serving over 90 Latino health and human service agencies in New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, and Pennsylvania. And it's under her leadership that the Federation has dramatically increased its organizational capacity to serve an ever-increasing network of member agencies and to respond to the Latino community's needs locally and nationally. So before she joined the Hispanic Federation, she worked at the New York Health and Hispanic Hospitals Corporation, which is a public benefit corporation which oversees New York City's public health care system, certainly an extremely large and important job and she currently serves as chair of New Yorkers for Smaller Classes and as co-chair of Broadband Everywhere. In addition, she's a member of the Citizens Union, the Wachovia Bank Community Board, the Manhattan Borough President Community Board Reform Committee, and recently, the new issue of People in Espanol magazine has included her as one of the 15 most influential Latinos in the nation. When I heard the topic of her talk, which really resonates for us at NJN Public Television and Radio because we certainly strive every day for excellence and for making an impact in people's lives through programs like Images of Mahanez and the Hispanic Youth Showcase and our nightly news and many other programs that are educational and connect. When I heard her talk about social entrepreneurship, doing good while doing well, I was very excited because when you think about social entrepreneurship, that's an extraordinary opportunity for all of us to think about and to do something significant with our lives and our time, and to do it very well. Please join me in a very warm welcome to Lillian, who does much good and does it so well. How are you doing tonight? Can you hear me? If I smack this, just bear with me. I, um, I'm a native New Yorker. I'm originally from the Bronx, 
I speak very quickly sometimes, and that's the good news. <laughs> And uh, I got to tell you, the, the thing about people in Espanol, I'm going to move stuff out of here, was extremely exciting. Two bad things about appearing in people in Espanol. They, I was next to Shakira, and they confused our pictures, okay? Uh, which, you know, I should have had Shakira's picture next to mine. And then they, um, they told everybody my age, okay? Now, America Ferrara from Ugly Betty is 23. Shakira's 31. I'm 45. I don't want six million people knowing how old I am. <laughs> but be it as it may, you take the good with the bad. So I just want to wish you all a good evening, and uh, I want to thank you for this gracious invitation to join you tonight and really to share my thoughts and experiences. It's a lovely campus um, and a wonderful institution. And I wanted to tell the dean, I actually don't have a problem that the fact that this was somebody's house, just one family, I'd live here. Uh, and I wanna thank Jim so much for the opportunity um, to be here and to speak at the Rothman Institute. And also Elizabeth for those very, very kind words. My mother would be very proud. She wouldn't believe them, but she'd be proud. Um, this is interesting. I've been asked uh, to speak to you tonight about my experiences as a social entrepreneur in the nonprofit world, as well as, well as share some learnings that I've picked up along the way. And uh, when I asked Jim, how broad is the audience? I mean, what, who's sitting there? And he said, high school students, college students, academics, parents, uh, business leaders. I said, okay, I'm just talking to the kids. <laughs> Because the rest of them are old and they know everything and you, I'm, you're the only ones that I might be able to impress. I have a, a young daughter and if I think about it, I don't, so I don't know what I was thinking. But what I want to talk to you about is, um, I am going to talk to you a little bit about the nonprofit world and how it relates um, to what you hopefully will do in your lives as entrepreneurs and as business leaders. But I also want to talk to you about what I perceive as the ways that we create individual success and how we seek innovation and perhaps how we leave a mark on the world. And when I noted who your previous speakers were for this series, people such as Anne Lindbergh, Doris Drucker, Andrea Wong, who have done, I think she did an innovation speech, just to name a few, I really was deeply flattered because it was clear to me that the Rothman Institute uh, drew important people here and was clearly a powerful incubator of future business leaders for this country. And so the fact that you sit here and are recognized in this way is critically important. Now, my lecture is entitled Social Entrepreneurship, Doing Good While Doing Well. And the first thing that I wanna share with you that is that running a nonprofit is like running a business. Your contributors or your contributions are your revenues. Your funders are your clients. And your business is health and human services. But we manage businesses. I manage a business with a heart. My imperative, my business imperative, is the social good of the communities and the people that I serve. My drivers are the betterment of Latino institutions and the progress of the Latino community. And as we move towards progress, what do I mean? Education, health, housing, small business development, promotion of entrepreneurship, arts and culture, just to name a few. And again, while we are businesses with a heart, I want you to know that I have stated many, many, many times that I am a compassionate capitalist. You give me more money, I do more good. <laughs> and that's the way it works. And you know, just clearly, <laughs> you like that, huh? You give me more money, I do more good. Clearly there are some major differences, but I really want to emphasize the similarities that exist. The need as a nonprofit manager, because I do see myself as a social entrepreneur, to manage resources effectively. Key among those resources, people and money. The need to analyze trends, have clear decision making, and change course when I have to. And since the Federation is not endowed and does not have enough multi-year contracts, 
Like most prophets, I start my year with zero-based budgeting, as you will in many of your businesses. If you need to raise $5 million in capital, you start projecting six to nine months ahead, how are you gonna achieve this goal? How are you gonna raise this money? And like businesses, nonprofits have a tremendously wide range of services and assets. Some teeny tiny in the thousands, some in the billions. And the geography can range from serving people just within four square blocks or maybe a mile to transnational work that will take you around the globe. So don't write nonprofits off as a career um, because it requires a tremendous amount of skill and talent to successfully run one. So, you know, that starts the speech, that's the social entrepreneurship piece, and I hope it does provide you with, uh, with some sense of how our industry compares to the industries that the broader audience is currently engaged in, or the young people want to enter. But as I was really thinking about the things that I have learned that I want to share with you, and could share with you without you thinking that I was crazy, you know, certain ideas came up, really four distinct ideas, and I want to tell you all four of them now, and then I want to reintroduce them to you one by one. And I think they're critical to social entrepreneurship, they are critical to all business people. First, if you give yourself the no, no one will have to. Second, if it was easy, everyone would be doing it. Third, if you stand for nothing, you fall for everything. And finally, you can do good and do well. First, let's talk a little bit about giving yourself the no, and no one else will have to. When I was 18 years old, it was yesterday, <laughs> I could have said that before the People article, I was, believe it or not, um, asked to manage a summer youth employment program in the Bronx. Basically, my job would be to um, take young people, 300 young people, and do job placement and payroll for a six week period. Um, this program hired people that were 14 through the ages of 22, which means I would be hiring and supervising uh, people that were older than I was. And uh, I don't know how many of you remember um, the Bronx in the late 70s or early 80s, but there were certain areas that you really did not want to travel into. But, you know, given all those facts, I said yes to the job. Uh, not because I was confident. Uh, not because I was so self-assured, basically because I was stupid. <laughs> I was stupid. I really did not know what I was getting myself into. But I figured that as long as I had the energy and commitment to figure things out, I could do this job. And I want to share with you that it wasn't the easiest summer that I ever had, but I prevailed. And to this date, I look back on that experience, and I'm grateful for it because it was the first step in preparing myself for the pressures and the other difficult work environments that would follow for me. Um, that, and they continue to follow, trust me. If you had seen me in the car coming over here, you would know. But you know, if you fail to give yourself those challenging experiences, uh, you have to. And I'll tell you why. Because for the rest of your life, you will be able to call on the reserves of character that were built in those earlier times. So what if I had said no? What if I had never ever asked about that job? I can tell you that I would be less than what I am today. So collect the no's. Collect the no's. And I swear to you, that in that sea of no's will emerge yeses. And unless you're willing to venture out, as you did with this wonderful competition, and take a risk and put yourself on the line, then you don't have to have anyone 
ever, ever give you a no because you'll give them to yourself. You will have that little voice in the top of your head that stores the words no, not, never. And I call that the instantaneous no that only you utter and only you hear. So collect them. I can't tell you how many times in the nonprofit business when we do policy or the work, people will say, you're being unrealistic. That's risky. You know what? It is. I am. I am. One of my favorite songs is by the New Radicals because there, uh, there's a line in there called the dreamer's disease. The difference is the dreamer's disease and the doer's disease. That's what I'm afflicted with. So take risks. And don't worry about people being cautious for you. Your mother will do that. Your father will do that. Your grandmother will do that. Uh, the adults here probably still have their mothers and fathers saying to them, what are you doing? Don't do that. We would have never done that. And trust me, raise the expectations that you have for yourself, and you will be your strongest ally because it will live in here and in here. And as you collect those no's, remember, you, always, you also collect experiences, good ones, enriching ones, that you will need in the world of being an entrepreneur or a business leader. The negative ones will creep in. They have to. That's life. But you usually don't regret the things that you do. I've regretted many times the things that I haven't done. And all experiences, every single one, teaches you something about yourself and the world that you live in. Second, if it was easy, everybody would be doing it. If it was easy, everybody would be doing it. Do you think that there were thousands of people accomplishing what the female CEOs of PepsiCo, Avon, or BET accomplished? that they just sat around waiting to be noticed, and voila, somebody came and tapped them on the shoulder and said, hey, you're a major business leader. It takes discipline, it takes perseverance, and it takes dedication to the work. It takes those characteristics and more for those women to achieve and all women to achieve and men to achieve what they've done and to even do the work that I do every day at the Hispanic Federation. So I've got a lot of young people who work for me. And when they cry that they're tired or whatever, I say, hey, it takes late nights without the TiVo. It means reading reports and policy papers and other things that are not necessarily the most fascinating things to read. Trust me, I want to know what Lindsay Lowen's doing. I know what Lindsay Lowen's doing. Paris Hilton, Nicole Richie. So I don't sacrifice it every single day, but sometimes I do. The other thing that it takes is being nice to people that you don't necessarily like. I have to be nice to people that I really, really don't like as a social entrepreneur. But the business relationship requires the cordial and pleasant interaction because people do business with people they know like and trust and I want to just uh, give you an example about what's not easy my first post-college job um, which which wasn't in in the resume was working at the CBS television group um, I was about 21 years old I had a degree in broadcast journalism and I was hired in the audience relations department and I'll tell you what I was doing basically I was reading the mail from viewers that was coming in for 60 minutes. Uh, for those of you who are old enough to remember this, um, the evening news with Dan Rathers, Dan Rather, and um, the CBS Morning News when Diane Sawyer was on it. And you know, just for the record, all the good ideas that they had for 60 minutes, they never made it onto my desk. I saw this stuff that they didn't want to even explore. But you know, I had to read the letters. I, and all these story pitches, and then I had to code them to determine what the response would be. And, you know, I was the youngest person in the department, 
And sometimes I got exciting work. I would love when I would run to the broadcast center, but most of the time it was grunt work. And then about a year into that position, I got a promotion. And I was gonna be the assistant manager and really moving, not just reading it, but I was not gonna be responsible for actually getting the correspondence out. And you know, I was gonna supervise two people, they were older than me, uh, very experienced at what they did. And the big job was that on average, we had to move out about 300 letters a day, uh, which is a lot. And it's not just churning out letters. Most of the time, people were asking for scripts or segments from news shows that they had seen on television. So, you know, we would log hours and hours of new segments and new shows, and you have to figure out, well, what are they talking about? They said they saw this. I don't know what that is, but you had to go in through the archives and find it. Um, and just so you know, this was the days before computers. The days before computers. Things were in hand logs. So we would, I would work and I would identify it. And, you know, it was a lot of hard work. And guess what? I worked in a big department. Nobody wanted that job. Guess why? It was hard work. It was really, really hard work. It created a lot of pressure. You were always matching letters to requests. Some requests man, uh, you know, required fees. I had all these daily targets of getting letters out and moving the documents. And when the other staff people would say goodbye at 5, at 5.30, I would a lot of times be there till 6 or 6.30, um, just moving the rest of the mail out. And my boss, a couple of times, I caught her putting hot rollers in her hair so she could leave for her dates. And so, you know, rank has its privileges and not all of them are good. But again, if it was easy, everyone in the department would have wanted to do it. They would have wanted the salary, they would have wanted the title, they would have wanted the increase in exposure. And so creating a business, innovation, getting ahead is not for the faint of heart. If you really wanna grow in your role, you're gonna to have to step out of your comfort zone and it takes hard work. Now, jumping up a couple of years, when I came to the Federation, I came to the Federation in 1996, I've been there 12 years. And during that time I was given, you know, progressively more responsibility. And in 1998, I had only been there about two and a half years, the president of the organization decided to move on and I was appointed president for an interim period, uh, which was gonna be about three and a half years. And I need to tell you, I thought they were nuts. I said, how could you give this institution some, some, someone give this institution to someone who had been there uh, two, and a half, two and a half years? Clearly, it wasn't a long-term period, but still, lots of things can collapse in a three and a half month period in a business. Um, and I really do look at the Federation as a business. Um, but then I realized that during that two and a half year period, they had worked with me to develop a lot of competencies in fundraising, in media, in public policy analysis, financial management, and that I had been really exposed to enough to run the Federation for that period. And so here we are uh, 10 years later, and obviously I did something right because I didn't, I didn't kill the institution. It's actually still standing and thriving. And then six years after that, in 2004, I became the president. So it's been three and a half years now. And my former boss, her name is Lorraine Cortez Vasquez, is now the Secretary of State for New York. And she's the first Hispanic to serve in the position as Secretary of State um, and also a woman. And, you know, I adore Lorraine, and I greatly respect her, but during those years, I hated her many times. Why? She always, always pushed me to do more. Public speaking, panels, presentations, giving out awards, working on budgets, working on contracting, doing pitches, the list and list goes, I mean, the list goes on and on. And if I told her, that I didn't want to do something, and I want to tell you, don't come work for me because I do the same thing now. If you tell me you don't want to do something, that's when you really have to do it. Because I know that I have to tackle fear and that there's a loss of confidence there. 
So that's the way she was with me. If I told her that I didn't want to do it, then I absolutely had to do it. And if you said you hated doing something that she knew was critical to your leadership development or your managerial development, then you got it as your full-time task. And there was a reason for that, because she was creating leadership. I hope she still thinks she was creating leadership. And you know, we always said to each other as we worked very closely together, and you know, we used to call, I used to say she, we were our partners in crime, this is not easy. God, this is not easy. I didn't tell you that at the Federation, because of who we are, we're a grant maker, we're a capacity builder, and we're a public advocate. We do advocacy in that sense. We deal with corporations, government, foundations. We deal with the general public. We deal with a lot of elected officials on the city, state, and federal level. And then we, we're a membership organization, so I deal with my peers. And if I'm tackling a policy issue, then I have to deal with the people who are involved in that policy issue, whether it's education or housing or child welfare. And so every industry, my friends, has its own huge, huge uh, circle um, and concentric circles. And so you have to really work very, very hard. But you know what? It's not supposed to be easy because you're supposed to get tested. And sometimes it will feel like you have to be Hercules to get through it. But most of the time, if you try hard, you will knock it out of the park. And then you will know that you have the guts to make things happen. And you know, you can decide um, as students, as college students, as young adults, I, I see that this is a very, you know, fairly broad composition in the audience to either live through it or TiVo it on CNN or Univision. That's your choice. You either can make it happen or you can watch it on television. And then next, because I think that this is really relatable to the nonprofit industry and also to business. If you stand for nothing, you fall for everything. I am in the business of health and human services, and I said that, developing communities and institutions and working to better lives. And there's a lot of things that we do that affect our ability to do that. Public policy, legislation, budgets, budget cuts, as well as many, many other interests that are related to politics, race, business, just to name a few. And in business, as entrepreneurs, what will you stand for? What will be your level of personal integrity? How will you judge what is right or just in the world? And I want to give you a, a difficult example of this, um, which, and we're in Madison, New Jersey, and I'm from Glen Ridge. And you know, the world of this country is very diverse, and I respect that diversity and the diversity of opinions. But Last year, we had a comprehensive immigration reform bill that was introduced into Congress. And as you all know, it was hotly debated. Uh, the bill uh, would determine the fate of over 12 million undocumented immigrants in this country. And it had a lot of very complicated and intricate provisions. And it was a bill that my organization, the Hispanic Federation, joined with other national organizations to analyze because we wanted to understand the impact on this very vulnerable immigrant population. And I don't need to, to go into any of the issues involved in the debate because we're pretty familiar with them. We lived them for months. But there were two overwhelming themes that emerged. The undocumented were either a threat to the economy, lawlessness, and the security of this country, or the undocumented immigrants reflected the history and the true fiber of this country. And they were deserving of an opportunity to openly and legally work and prosper in the United States. And what stood in the balance was really great for this community. American citizenship that would lead to many, many benefits and opportunities. And we all know that the bill did not get through the Senate 
And guess what? The Federation opposed the bill. We opposed that bill. And people asked us, how could we oppose the bill? Would it not have created a lot of opportunities for these individuals and their families? Did they not have a need to come out of the shadows? And I'm going to tell you why we opposed it. We opposed it because we saw a bill that would potentially lock this country into a system for years that didn't value family reunification, that would send individuals and their families back to their home countries for years waiting to return to the United States, and that it would create a guest worker program that was essentially indentured servitude. Come, to, come work for two years, you could not go to another employer if you were badly treated by that current employer, go back to your country for another year, establish a life for a year, and then we would let you come back for another two years. And that's why we had a problem with it. Not because we didn't believe that people didn't have the right or the opportunity to become American citizens, but because we thought it was the wrong kind of bill. And, you know, it was, in our estimation, something that would have overwhel it had overwhelmingly punitive measures and would create a huge financial burden on a community that was already burdened. But imagine how difficult it was to know that millions were waiting for federal legislation to have freedom and progress, and yet to have to educate them about a very flawed bill. We stood for what we thought was just and fair uh, because we believed that it went against the American values. And I want to share with you that I do do a lot of public policy and advocacy at many levels. And at times, I've been pleasantly surprised by the way things align nicely with other groups in our network and in our sector in the world. Sometimes we play nicely together. Other times, I've been shocked or saddened by the actions of other groups whose views and reactions are so opposite to ours. The upside is that we can always agree to disagree and often a view, uh, opposing viewpoints, opposing viewpoints can often enrich decisions and outcomes. So as a social entrepreneur, as the future leaders and entrepreneurs, you will need to know what you stand for. You will need to know what your values are as they relate to workers, as they relate to global diversity, how you negotiate, how you compete, how you accumulate wealth. So I think it's vital that you understand or begin to understand what your core values are and how they intersect with the norms of your work environment or the industry that you're gonna choose to be in. The challenge for all of us, the challenge for me every day, is to know when to bend, but not to break. And to stand firmly for the values that you hold dear. And then, you know, this brings me, because I never thought I could talk this long, but I guess it's not the way my husband probably felt. <laughs> Um, sorry for that, but I, you know, I, 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 as a, when I hear speakers, I need some comic relief. You, you know, you get too deep and I just, it's like, enough, enough, Lil. Um, and then this brings me really um, to my final thoughts about doing good and doing well. And this actually applies to everyone in this room, not just these very, very talented young people. And I can't begin to tell you how excited I was um, to see so many young women as well um, receiving these awards today. It makes me very, very proud and very, very hopeful. And with that, what I want to share is regardless for everyone, where you find yourself in life, you can give back in time, you can give back in money and obligations. And, and why do I say the, or use the word obligations? Because I think time and money are fairly transparent. Um, because when you acknowledge 
obligations, what you're acknowledging is that we have stood and stand on the shoulders of other people. That we have a responsibility to look back and to bring others along in the same way that we were guided or supported. So if you're doing well in terms of your personal wealth, it's not the only thing that we carry, your influence, power, imagine how much good you can do. Imagine how much good comes from picking up a phone, having a conversation, deciding that you're gonna share something critically important with people who perhaps are more needy than you are. If you share it and you unleash it, it is a tremendous tool. And what I'm asking everyone here, but particularly our young people as you finish your you know, high school education, I'm not sure what grade you're in and you decide to go on to college, um, and, and make huge successes of yourself. I already see that you have the seeds for this. What I'm asking is that you choose to make yourself a powerful statement of progress and that you use that to do good while you do well. There is, this is the country of opportunity. This is the country of ideas. This is a country about global diversity and putting your best foot forward always. There are no greater opportunities that, than those that are available in the United States. But because to whom much is given, much is expected, I think much is expected of us as a nation. I take what I do very seriously. I think much is expected of me in the course of my work because people depend on me. And so people will depend on you as business leaders and entrepreneurs. Please make sure that you're prepared to meet that challenge and that you do step up to the plate. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Thank you. I have been um, told, because I guess it's, it's, this is awesome, this is the world according to Jim, and I like that. I like to be told what to do, that I uh, can take questions, which is great. Um, geez, that's a wonderful question, and it would come from a woman. <laughs> um, I am highly stressed, but the, the question was, how do you handle stress, um, you know, in the business setting? Uh, I think that uh, I, you, it's very stressful. It is a very stressful position to be in. I think that what I'm known for is the passion and uh, the love of what I do. So I think that when you believe in what you do, I think it helps the stress. Uh, I do want to say, though, because usually I, I speak in front of a lot of women's groups, and one of the questions that I get asked is, what is, how do you handle the stress, and also what, you know, how do you balance things? I tell people, you cannot. Um, whatever you're doing at that point in time, you have to try to give that 150% and know that other things are not getting done. And the other thing is, and I'll say this to the people that, you know, this young man here in the front. Um, you can have everything. You can't have it all at the same time. It's not true. Something will give. Um, and you know, what gives uh, is different for different people. Um, you just have to balance the priorities and decide what are your top priorities. Uh, I'm a single mother and I have a 16 and a half year old. She didn't want to come today, even though I wanted her to see the campus. Uh, <laughs> But, you know, I, I, I tell you what I have done. I am married to my job and I am married to my daughter. And that's it. Until things change. There was a question here, I think. Okay, let me, let me tell you how, um, I, I didn't want to, because I didn't want to bore you with this, sort of the details of the job, but 
What happens is the Hispanic Federation is a nonprofit membership network. So we have 97 independent Hispanic organizations that are under our umbrella. They have their own executive directors, their own board of directors, uh, and the, their own staffs and their own independent budgets. What happens is that they fall under our umbrella because we're a grant maker, we're a capacity builder, so we mount projects and initiatives that benefit them, and we do a lot of public policy work. So we end up being a facilitator and convener around a lot of their issues. Um, when you have a network that is as large as ours is, it is very difficult. You cannot be everywhere all the time, and you cannot tackle every single infrastructure issue, because we focus heavily on operations, because we believe that good nonprofits run like good businesses, and every policy issue. So I have to pick and choose. Sometimes people say, can you help me with this? And I'll say, I have too much on my radar. I can't focus on that. And I'll try to guide them in another direction, or we'll have to delay the process. The good thing that has, the, the one extremely powerful thing that comes out of this network is that we emerge as somewhat of an 800 pound gorilla in New York. So, you know, we gain a strong, strong voice from our very, very large membership. We gain a strong voice nationally because of our very large membership. But I would never pretend to say that I operate them. What I do is coordinate a lot of work and initiatives and activities with them and through them so that we are more powerful as a group. Uh, and we don't do direct service. We leave that to them. We really, um, we have a lot of vertical integration in terms of how we work. Um, but we really, um, there's something that's used uh, uh, to describe nonprofits. I really don't love the phrase, but it's called being grass tops. And we're grass tops versus grassroots. Yes. Good question. Uh, she wants to know if I'm a 501c3, a 501c4, and what, it, what are our major sources of funding, and whether or not... Oh, Shad, okay. First question. The Hispanic Federation charges no membership dues. We have no interest in that at this point in time. We're 18 years old. What we exact is loyalty. When I call, I need you to come. No dues. Um, we are a 501c3, um, and we are not a 501c4. What I do is have an election under the IRS ruling that allows us to do advocacy and lobbying. I forget what it's called. I think it's an H9 or something like that. We are highly, highly diverse in terms of our funding. We're almost equally divided between corporate foundation and government funding. And in terms of corporations, it's pretty much all sectors. Finance, investment, media, entertainment, pharmaceuticals, um, all kinds of, of companies that are doing business internationally, but, you know, U.S.-based businesses. And then the foundations, you, you know, the ones you would typically expect. Take a student question. <laughs> oh, what a great question. She wants to know if I felt the influence of the glass ceiling um, at all. Yeah, absolutely. It would be a lie to say no. This was the biggest problem too. Um, when you enter the workforce as a young woman, you're so young that nobody takes you seriously. It's bad. Um, and so for the women or the young women in the audience, I would tell you that I would always compensate for that with a very, uh, not, a very serious kind of demeanor and dressing and all that because I knew that I had to compensate um, for my age. Um, there are boys' networks. Um, they are interesting to balance. Um, you know, you try to, you want to be seen as... Um, engaging, friendly, uh, smart, articulate. You have to be careful never to cross the line. Uh, for the young women in the audience too, I never do social drinking when I'm doing business. 
there is nothing you will ever go to even here that is not a business event. You cannot, you must mind your P's and Q's. And so I don't drink. Now I'll nurse a glass of water, I'll make them put it in a glass so it looks like I'm drinking vodka. Uh, you know, I was never much of a drinker anyway, but I, I mean, we could talk separately. I could tell you, honey, there are a thousand things you need to watch out for. If you're ugly, that's bad. If you're pretty, that's bad. If you're too dowdy, she's dowdy. That's the other thing about being a female leader and a female manager. How many of you in the audience have sisters or daughters? Okay. Be kind to them. <laughs> be kind to your girlfriends. They could be your sisters. That's a great image. Um, you know, you, there's a lot of pressure on women in the workplace and, and in business. Um, and I think that you have to be, as again, I want to reemphasize, you have to be extremely careful about your demeanor, your attitude, the way you dress. Um, you want to stay true to yourself, but I would be, a, I would, I don't want to misinterpret that it's all easy and you're free to be you and me and all that. I'm sorry, that's not the case. And also, um, look at the culture of where you work. Um, Look at the culture. You used to look at the way people speak, the way they manage themselves, the way they dress, and to the greatest extent, mimic that if you want to get ahead also. Um, you can't be a maverick until you're the boss. Yes, ma'am. Um, I would just like to ask you a personal question. Sure. <laughs> She wants to know, um, do I have a mentor and do I mentor others? Absolutely yes. Absolutely yes to both. I have a mentor. Um, I actually uh, am very close to the Secretary of State of New York, having worked for her uh, for six years directly and having uh, done things with her when she was in the... Uh, she used to be at the New York State Assembly as Chief of Staff to a, a, a county chairman in the Democratic Party. So I turned to her for a lot of advice and she mentors me. She's not the only one. I probably have about two or three that uh, I turn to and get career advice, uh, political advice, all kinds of advice. But they're not all women, they're also men just so you know, uh, because uh, men have been a great source of support. And I do mentor lots of people. Um, I mentor young women, I mentor young men. Uh, sometimes I find that the men listen to me better, uh, which is interesting, um, and they come back. Um, I can't get rid of them. They call me Titi Lily. And so, it, you know, it varying dis, you know, with varying success. I mean, I could tell you two of them are lawyers now, another one just got his MBA at Stanford. Uh, a whole bunch of them have gotten graduate degrees. I do mentor, and I'm a strict mentor. Oh, uh, because I'm no nonsense. I'm like, please, you know what? You know, tell that stuff to your friends. You know, take it somewhere where somebody really believes you. So I'm a strict mentor, but I've been mentored, and I've had strict mentors. You know, no nonsense. I mean, you know, you don't want to be brutal, but <laughs> you also want to be honest. One more question. Yes. Yes. What are your biggest barriers as a social entrepreneur, and have you overcome those barriers? My. Oh my God, she's. You weren't supposed to put little psychiatrists in the rooms. <laughs> um, let me give you a great analogy um, because I think it's no different than, let's just say, well, I'm not gonna use that example. I was gonna talk about Wall Street. You inherit an institution or a business that has con is considered to be very successful, whatever it is, even if it's a nonprofit, strong history, strong budget, this, that, the other, your greatest fear every single day is that you will fail. That's my base fear, that one day I will make a decision that will create a downturn in the organization. It could be a financial one or it could be a political one. Uh, it could be an administrative one. Institutions are organic, right? They're organic. Um, the right mix of people affects how well it gets managed. Your decision making is critically important. Um, I'm gonna give you a real uh, true to life experience. I became president three and a half years ago. Three years ago, I decided that we needed to own space. 
it had been something that had been in discussion already and the rents were escalating in uh, New York as they always are, right? It was the peak of the market, residential and commercial. And I decided that we would go into a commercial uh, purchase. We now own 14,000 square feet around the corner from the New York Stock Exchange, which I know is an odd location for the Hispanic Federation, but I wanted to fly the banner and have every single person who came go, oh my God, what is that for Hispanic Federation in front of the New York Stock Exchange? It was, a, it was a message about our permanency and our importance in this country. $7 million deal. We put 20% down. I had to close the deal, find financing for the deal, bridge financing, talk about social entrepreneurship, and try to get state support launch a capital campaign all at the same time. I was balancing that we would be able to put down the 1.5 million, that I would be able to get $4 million in state and city support, and that a bank would take us seriously enough as a nonprofit to do this for us. That was very, very scary. That was very risky. And at the same time, I was creating uh, an entrepreneurial uh, kind of center. We created a nonprofit conference center that our membership could use, but that we could also rent. We wanted fee for service. We wanted to generate dollars. And that was really, really risky because putting 1.5 million down and doing all those things simultaneously could have really um, collapsed the organization. And I'll tell you what happened. We are there a year and a half now. Knock on wood, should knock here. However, last year, Man, they should have put me in charge of Citibank or City. I watched every single penny. I have never been better at cash flow, cash management, collections and receivables than I was last year. Nothing like making a major purchase to make you realize that the cushion is not always there. And I think you were the last question, darling. Thanks, Lillian. And uh, my first question is, uh, will you be one of my mentors? <laughs> no. Uh, thank you for that thoughtful, thoughtful, very thoughtful um, speech, uh, those words of wisdom. And um, I won't get in my soapbox, but the reason why New Jersey is so special is because of our diversity. And if you saw all these students come up here, you'd recognize that. Now, that's the key to our success uh, going forward. So I'll leave it at that. So thank you. I